Welcome to the FBAA's Top Broker Podcast for mortgage brokers looking to take their business to the next level with your host, Joshua Vecchio. Today we have Hank the Bank Hong, a mortgage broker for Vault Lending Solutions, based in Sydney, multi award winning, and one of Australia's most recognized names. In today's episode, we're looking at how you can create your own luck, discussing the importance of tracking your progress towards success. By the end of today, you're going to feel confident in knowing exactly how you can create consistency in your settlements. So let's jump in. Hello and welcome. I'm Josh Vecchio, and this week we have one of Australia's most recognized brokers. His name is Hank the Bank Hong. Hank, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So Hank, for those who may not have heard of you, why don't we start off with a quick snapshot of who you are and your business? Basically, uh, I've been a mortgage broker for, it'd come up to probably about eight, uh, eight years, eight and a half years now. We're currently running a uh, partnership with a, a new gentleman and previously worked for a, a world, I guess a, a very well-known uh, mortgage firm uh, for about seven, eight years. Awesome. And how do you get in the industry? Because I know you've got a pretty uh, interesting story there. Um, look, in, in, I think my story is probably a lot different to a, a lot of other brokers out there. Um, my story is, was I was 18 um, at university in my first year of university. One of the guys that I was studying with uh, approached me and said, do you want a job? So I rocked up to Parramatta and um, basically this is back in the day when cold calling was still legal. And I sat there for six months, cold calling the white pages and the other pages. And what I found out was I was actually working for a, a mortgage manager. I didn't even uh, think about going into mortgage, uh, into brokering, but that was my first step. Love it. And you is en- eventually work your way through to becoming a mortgage broker? Correct. So I did f- I did three years um, pretty much as a basic receptionist, doing the basic or, or the data entry work uh, for the mortgage manager. After that, I actually uh, went to work for Resi uh, as a credit officer for four years. Um, after that, it was seven years with uh, Home Loan Experts and uh, recently now eight months in my own company. And with that journey, what sort of grounding has that done for you? Because I know a lot of brokers, they either come out from a bank or they go directly mm-hmm. into their own business. What are yes. you finding? I mean, with that journey, did that give you a bit more of a sort of firm grasp on everything everything around mortgages, not just the sales piece? Uh, correct. The the the, the, the hardest thing about running a business now is running a business. For for the past positions I was in before, I was always just a, a contractor or an employee. So it's it's a lot. Uh, you have to build up a few more skill sets to run your business. What have been the hardest skill sets to maybe develop to make that transition from employee to business owner? Employee to business owner, the biggest thing was um, you have to keep yourself accountable. Now, working for a business or working as a contractor, your employer or whoever you work for is going to be always giving you uh, giving you targets and quotas to hit each month. And they're always going to be keeping track of that. But if you're on your, on your own business, you've got to make yourself accountable for the, uh, for the numbers of loans. Is there anything you do that you do now to keep yourself accountable? Basically, at the moment, I've got a I've got an eight four rule. So each month we need to submit in at least eight million dollars, and we need to settle four. This is from our new business that, that we've started uh, for the last four months. So if we don't submit eight million dollars this month, we have to make the difference up the following month. And how do you do that? How do you control that? Is it getting on the calls? Is it seeing more referral partners? Is, is there some actionable items that you say, hey, look, next month then we have to do this, that, the other? Correct. Well, we reach out to referral partners, reach out to existing clients. If you if you build up a book and you're currently contacting all the clients on certain periods, there's always a contact point to potentially get another referral. If we're short this month, then next month, myself, my partner will have to go out and make sure we have a, a lunch or coffee with our referral partners and drum up that business, the business back up. So when you have a coffee with a referral partner, is it a social catch-up? Is it a business catch-up where you're saying, hey, look, where's my business? What does that look um, like? It's, it's absolutely social. Right. It's absolutely social. Because they know why you're there. You know why you're there. So it's 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 pretty much an un... Uh, you should understand both of the relationship. If they're all referring business to you, it's catch-up, see how life is, ask, ask a couple of questions, of course, like, 
have you seen any other clients that have this and that? I know that kind of goes against to what we said before being so, uh, a social engagement, but you don't want to just start the conversation with, I need more referrals or have you got any clients? Yeah, keeping that flame warm and then having the permission Correct. to talk about um, going off topic from social to business and then back into Correct. social and keeping Correct. that balance really. The best the best referrers out there have become friends. Um, uh, and actually, the best referrers out there are friends that are working in different industries or working in different departments. Friendship is the first key. And if you don't have friendship there, I know I've had um, referral partners in the past where I didn't necessarily enjoy spending time with them. And, and in the end, I said, you know what, this is not a relationship I want to follow. It makes it really hard to take it to that next level because the trust just doesn't come through, does it? Correct. Correct. And uh, look, there's a high chance that, that referral partner has three or four other uh, mortgage brokers chasing them for business. So if you don't have that friendship in place, there's a, a, a less likely chance of you receiving that referral. Now, Hank, I know the one thing that you do is that you you have a routine set in stone almost. So I know you get up at five o'clock each and every day. What's your routine yes. each and every day look like? Basically, five o'clock, I'll, I'll pretty much go through all my emails. So my email has uh, would rarely go over five emails. I use my email box as a um, as a task reminder as well. So if I've got if I've got an email in there, I've got to make sure I've got to sort that out. Once it's been done, I've I've moved into the folders. So I will go through all the emails that have come through overnight, start collating all the files together. So five to five five o'clock to about seven o'clock, answer all emails, shoot them all off. I've started downloading all the app- applications and uh, documents from the emails, and I'll be putting them to file, and I'll start renaming them. And pretty much after that, about 7.38, rock up to the office, have a morning coffee, and pretty much uh, 9 o'clock, the ball runs. So by 9 o'clock, I'm already calling the banks in regards to the deals that I need to chase up. And usually between the 7, to, uh, seven 8, 9 o'clock, I'm already working on those deals that, that have come through overnight. So the start time for a broker should be – you should be ready by 8.30. Wow. You should be just uh, polishing off your phone. And 9 o'clock, anything you need to chase up at the bank, you should hit them straight away. So what would you say to brokers out there that say, I work 9 to 5? You're not a broker. If you want to be a self-employed broker, you're working 12 hours a day. You're working 16 hours a day. You're working Saturdays. Um, you're working Sundays. And I'm not saying you're well, Saturday, Sundays, you're working eight hours straight, but you've at least got to work a couple of hours. So I work on Saturday morning up to about 11 o'clock, and then I switch off for the rest of the time. And Sunday night, I start up again probably around seven o'clock, and I start going for emails. And what has this allowed you to do? So working more than nine to five, what has this done for your business? Working more, more, more than hours means I reply back to my clients faster. Um, I can do a larger amount of business. Basically, if you work hard, you make more money. It, it's 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 the broker side of things. You've got to hit the ground and you've just got to get those loans. The harder you work, the more money you make. The luckier you get. What? Um, yeah. I know you reply to your clients instantaneously almost. And when you do, yes. you don't necessarily give them a solution, but you give them a, a timeline, don't you? What do you do there? Yes. Man, you must be stalking my emails. <laughs> um, <laughs> so th- th- there's a couple of things uh, I do is when a client's email comes through, I will reply back received. So every single email they ever send through will always say received um, or I'll be working the deal at one o'clock, so I'll give them a timeline. Even if they say thank you, I'm always the last person to reply back to them. And usually it's with a smiley face because you can't, if they say thank you, you say thank you. They say you're welcome. But if you say smiley face, smiley face finishes the story. So I'm always the last person in the email chain. That's my my task that I know that I've completed that email. So instantaneous, I'll have conversations with clients uh, by email and work without even have to, having a phone call. Because sometimes they're sitting at their table in the office and we shoot emails back and forth like a pretty much live chat. And I'll get all the information I need and I can pump the deal through. So, Hank, final question. I know you've got an awesome end-of-day routine. Why don't you tell us about that? <laughs> um, so, basically, my end-of-day routine is, and you can you can ask my, my business partner, I usually finish up around 3, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and I go home and I, I watch cartoons. Um, and during that time, I, I de-stress. And because I've done all the work during the day already, and by the time 3, 4 o'clock comes, the banks usually close at 5, so I'll just be on my mobile, look over to my laptop and just see if there's any emails coming through, just answer them. But 
pretty much wind down by watching cartoons. Nice. And I know you've got a um, a journal that allows you – because I know a lot of brokers, what the problem is that they go to sleep but they don't get any rest and they wake up and they can only think about the things that are going wrong. But you've got a journal, I hear, that you essentially throw all your issues or your, your challenges in that journal. I think this is very important for all brokers. Basically, but by the end of the day, you probably have a couple of deals that have been headaches and they've taken up your time. You need to write that down into a journal, like usually a diary, so it's dated. And what I actually uh, used to do as well was I'd write down the issues, write down all the client headaches, and then when I'd look back about two, three months later, I'd look and go, well, that wasn't that bad. That actually settled. But when you're right in the middle of the headache of that client, or like a settlement of some sort, or getting the loan approved, it seems dire straits. But on hindsight, once it's all done, you look back, it's not bad. Now, putting it all into the journal, it compartmentalizes off. It's, how do I say, it's like one of those uh, positive things. You write Mm. on on a piece of paper and you put it away. So it's off your brain. I've had issues where I knew there was issues coming in three months later. So I'd actually used to write it on a piece of paper. I'd put it under this uh, little wishing rock we've got at home. And I wouldn't even look at it. Because once I've written it down, it's out of my mind. I've even heard of some people, what they do is they write it on a piece of paper and they actually uh, set it afire. And it's almost like it's a um, it's a way in which it's you can let go. It's a ritual. You can yes. let go and yes. you can say it's gone. I can't control yes. that anymore. I'd get a lot of brokers to do that, especially. You need to de- de-stress and it allows you to work harder. Very important. Well, Hank, thank you so much for being on this podcast. Absolutely. Thank you, Josh. My big three takeaways from this episode was one, keep yourself accountable. Have goals and minimum benchmarks for everything in your business. As it's been said, what gets measured gets done. So, for example, if you don't submit four mil for the month, there should be a consequence. If you do it, then by all means celebrate, have a goal. But without the measurement, you won't know whether or not you're achieving your goals or failing. Two, if you're short on leads, contact old clients and ask the question. Unless you ask, you won't know. And you'll be surprised how many leads you get and introductions you get from past clients that are extremely happy with your service. And three, if you're not working 12 hour days, you're not a broker. There's more competition and there's continuously more competition coming in the market with online digital brokers and even automated brokers. But nothing can beat hustle. Nothing can beat hard work. So these were my big three takeaways. What about you? We'd love to hear them. Share your thoughts on our private Facebook group. Simply search topbroker.com.au.